And my job as the CFO, and I think you had someone on the on the podcast uh, a few episodes ago who said that they were essentially a storyteller. And, and I'm in that same camp, right? I think that the most important job for most CFOs is storytelling. It, it is being able to make the numbers that you have in front of you mean something to the people you're talking to. Is this thing on? Yesterday's price is not today's price. Thank you, Fat Joe, and welcome back to Run the Numbers with CJ. I am CJ, and I just interviewed CFO Stephen Grist. Stephen is a seven-time CFO. This guy has more experience than I would know what to do with. He's probably forgotten more than I know. We talk about what a CFO should look to accomplish in their first 100 days at a new company. So if you're an incoming CFO, you're a new CFO, he gives a playbook of what you should go over, how you should assess and shore up the team, understanding cash drivers, and the systems and processes that you should put in place. We also talk about what he says in the first board meeting as an incoming CFO. Does he try to tell a story? Does he give it to them straight? What are the topics he touches upon? He tells us the most important relationships to invest in other than the CEO when you first come into a new job. Tip, CRO is one of them. And we talk about forecasting R&D spend. We go deep on this one. So for all of you out there who are trying to figure out when a dollar you put into the machine uh, should come out on the other side of the roadmap as a revenue dollar. This is an episode you won't want to miss. We also talk about staffing technical resources and the percentage that should be uh, linked to incubating a new product, investing in an existing product, or maintaining an existing product. These are rules of thumb that I'm going to write about, and mostly metrics. And Stevens managed teams all around the globe. Uh, and with uh, cross-border teams come cross-border problems. He has some stories that uh, absolutely blew my mind, some involving uh, snafus on the legal side of things. Steven is an excellent storyteller and a guy with, with a wealth of information. You will not want to miss this one if you like a good CFO story. All this and much, much more after a short word from our sponsors. Annual planning season is upon us. That's right, my favorite time of year. And it's not just about setting goals for the coming year. It's about ensuring you have the right tools in place to measure and achieve those goals. As a SaaS CFO, I know having access to reliable, real-time metrics is crucial for my annual planning process. That's why I'm so excited to partner with today's sponsor, Maxio. Maxio is a billing and financial operations platform that helps subscription businesses reconcile bookings, billings, gap revenue, and SaaS metrics automatically. By the way, guys, bookings, billings, gap revenue, not the same thing. Got to get them straight. Because these numbers are the foundation of your financial models, it's important to have quick access and trust they are correct. Don't let the complexities of SaaS finance and accounting slow you down. If you want to start 2025 with the right tools, check out Maxio by visiting maxio.com forward slash run the numbers. That's M-A-X-I-O dot com forward slash run the numbers. Request a demo through our link to support the podcast, your boy, and receive a 10% discount on your first year with Maxio. That's maxio.com forward slash run the numbers. M-A-X-I-O dot com forward slash run the numbers. Please, guys, I really need this. Okay, serious question for all my accounting pros here today. Are you doing what you were hired to do? What I mean is, do you have time to actually be a business partner or are you buried in tedious manual tasks just to get your journal entries prepared every month? I know how that feels. LeapFin's here to help with that. LeapFin is accounting automation software that automatically prepares and posts reliable journal entries. And that's just the beginning. High growth businesses like Reddit, Canva, and Seeky choose LeapFin to eliminate manual tasks accelerate month and close, and enable accounting leaders like you to provide faster insights that will help your company grow. If you're battling messy transaction data from Stripe, Adyen, Shopify, Apple Pay, and other PSPs, and then battling again to get it all into NetSuite, go to leapfin.com to watch their short product intro video. And if you like what you see, request a 15 minute conversation to learn how accounting automation can help you and your team. Check out leapfin.com today. That's leap like jump, fin like shark. I just made that up. I hope they're okay with it. Leapfin.com. Steven, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, CJ. I think I have this right. You're a seven-time CFO. Uh, you've probably gone through my LinkedIn profile. Uh, yeah, seven sounds about right. Somewhere wow. in the middle, I was also a CEO for uh, for a year or so. But yeah, seven or eight. 
I think that's the record for the show so far. So I wanted to get your qualified opinion on this. What should a CFO look to accomplish in their first 100 days at a new company? Well, I think the most important thing is assessing the team that you've got in place. Uh, And if necessary, shoring up uh, that team. You need to know at the end of those 100 days who's who's on the bus for the journey. So that that's my first priority. The next thing is getting a handle on cash, understanding what are the cash drivers in any business. It doesn't matter if you're VC backed, private equity backed, uh, leveraged, or if you're, if you're Apple and sitting on, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank. You need to understand where the cash is coming from. You need to understand it short term and long term and get a real handle on your working capital. And also, obviously, if you are in a leveraged environment, you've got to understand your covenants and you've got to understand how close you are going to get to those covenants. Uh, and that's, that to me, that's absolutely, absolutely critical in those first hundred days. And then I'm, I'm very, I'm very systems oriented. I love systems and processes and, and figuring out how to work better with data. And so I try to map out all of the key systems and processes in that in that time and see where there's some obvious uh, areas of weakness, uh, obvious areas for improvement and start towards start working towards a plan that can that can improve those. And finally, it kind of depends on the sort of business that you're in. Uh, I've been in private equity backed uh, portfolio companies for the last uh, nine years or so. And I need to assess, okay, how are we going to build towards exit readiness? Like, where are we with the long-term plan? Do I think that this team that's around me and the systems that we have around me, so looking at all of those things, do I think that they are going to be there when we're getting to the point of an exit? Or do I need to take some action either in the team or the systems or or whatever so that I'm heading in that direction? Because you never know. Uh, it could come at almost any time. Uh, if you're in a private equity backed portfolio company, you, you're always for sale, potentially. That's an excellent list of four or five things once you step through the door. What I wanted to call out is that understanding how cash enters and leaves a building, that was something that I was maniacally focused on on day one because I looked at it like this is now my responsibility to understand this better than everybody else. And every business and people who have done this before will understand what I'm talking about has specific nuances that like to another company may look weird or it just may take some time to understand the vendors that you're paying. So understanding how cash enters and leaves the building like is is so key just to just to get the rhythm down of the business i feel like and and it is kind of like learning on the fly yeah no absolutely and if you try and do a cash flow forecast that is your monthly cash flow forecast associated with your budget or with your long-term plan then that hides some aspects of your cash movements the the ebb and flow during the course of a month like when do you make your payroll you know, in Europe, we tend to pay payroll only once, once yeah. a month. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. But do you pay maybe in the middle of the month? And when do you invoice your, when do you invoice your customers? When, when's that cash actually going to come in? And, and, and then you can start seeing once you've got an idea of what those levers are, how do you pull them? How do you, how do you make them work better for you? When I came into the current business, uh, we were, we were invoicing our, we're a software as a uh, software as a service business, right? We were invoicing our customers you know, monthly in arrears or maybe monthly in advance, but, uh. but not in any way in accordance with best practice. I was like, uh, guys, have we thought about, you know, quarterly in advance and annually in advance? Yeah. Could we, could we begin to move to that? And we did. And the, the impact of that was, was quite monumental in probably six months. I managed to get our salespeople from, oh, that they'll, the customers will never accept that. Of course we can't go and do that. They're used to this monthly invoicing to now 93% of our, of our billing is annually in advance. And the only people that we're not invoicing in that way are some, you know, regional governments that have particular rules that they, they can't do it. So, so, it, and it makes a huge difference to your cash headroom if you do something like that. Oh, what an excellent call out. So I did something similar when I first came aboard. I noticed that our, so we have suppliers who pay us at the end of each month based on how much transactions went through, uh, 
in our marketplace. And so the templates that we had for the suppliers when we would sign them on, Stephen, were, it was always net 45. And when I came in, I said, I'm just going to change this to net 30 and see who screams. And people told me like, they will absolutely never accept that. Like mm. suppliers in this industry will, will never do that. And I think out of like the 10 next ones we sent it out to, only like two actually said something. It was like the bark was worse than the bite. Yeah. And sometimes your own worst enemies can be can be the salespeople in your own business, yeah. right? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, and, and some of them get, they, they sort of, um, they find themselves almost as if they're working for the customer rather than, <laughs> rather than for you. Uh, I, I remember, and, and sometimes, and it's particularly bad when you're selling into, into government. In my last yep. business, we sold, we sold to the government a lot. And, and we would have salespeople who were, for example, a French salesperson in France selling to the French government. Well, he, he feels strongly passionate and nationalistic about his country. So, so he's got this weird dilemma in any negotiation with the customer of like, how hard can I push them? Cause, cause I'm French and I want to make sure that right. I'm doing the best deal for the French state as well as obviously doing my job. That's hilarious that that conflict of interest can be there. But also salespeople just want a structure that's easier to sell off the back of the truck. Like, grease the skids for me here, man. Sure, sure. Steven, you, you've definitely come into companies where there was probably very little finance function and then others where there was a pretty robust, you know, team there and set of controls, good or bad. If, if you could choose, what would you rather come into? Something that's pretty well built out that you then have to assess and maybe make some big changes or something that's not really there yet? You know, it's probably, probably the latter because the inertia when you've got systems, in particular, if they've been in place for, for a long time and you're trying to, you're trying to shift them uh, to something that's more efficient, uh, and more modern. Cause a lot of, a lot of finance teams who may be listening to this, they, you know, they, they may have had systems in for eight years, 10 years or something like that. And there have been so many changes in the availability of systems out there today and, and what, mm. what modern accounting systems and ERP systems can, can do for you that can completely change the way in which a business is run. It, in my in my last business at Bohemia, when I came into that business, it was fairly traditional. Right? They had local accounting systems, and and they would create Excel spreadsheets, and they'd do their consolidation in Excel. It was a complete it was a complete nightmare. But it gave me the opportunity to say, well, this is obviously not a scalable solution, and sure. I was able to implement in that case an ERP only because the salespeople hadn't. They hadn't started taking the Salesforce drug, right? So they were in some other pipeline management tool. And I said to them, you know what? I'm not going to approve you going to Salesforce until you look at this other alternative because I could see the benefit of ripping out all of this horrible local stuff and consolidating it. So I could see the benefit of putting in something that would give me an end to end picture. And I ended up implementing uh, NetSuite in that case. And, and we went all the way from leads, opportunities, quotes, uh, to invoices, to close one contracts, to accounting, to, to even the support sitting in one place. And if you've got a completely greenfield site, that opportunity is great for you to be able to implement something that can give, give people a holistic view of, of the business in one place, there's no reconciling, oh, well, the RevOps team in their system here have got you know, one set of numbers and finance has got a completely different set of numbers. If everybody's working off the same set of numbers, it makes a, makes a huge difference to your ability to communicate that within the business to the GLT, to the exec team generally, to the, to the board. But often salespeople will have Salesforce and you can't take Salesforce away from them. That, that, that's like taking a calculator there would away be a from, mutiny. A, from a CFO. Exactly. So at that point, you just got to work within the context that you're, that, that you're operating in. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. What does the future hold for business? Can someone invent a crystal ball? Until then, over 38,000 businesses, wow, that's a lot of companies, have future-proof their business with NetSuite by Oracle. The number one cloud ERP, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one platform. 
With real-time insights and forecasting, you're able to peer into the future and seize new opportunities. Download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning for free at netsuite.com slash metrics. That's netsuite.com slash metrics. M-E-T-R-I-C-S, metrics. Please, guys, I really need this. As a CFO, I can say firsthand that the most important thing to know is how money enters and leaves the building, full stop. Without a simple and easy to monitor financial system, you're flying blind. And I'm the kind of guy who likes to have all my tools in one place. I'm talking checking accounts, bill pay, credit cards, and everything else I need to run a business. I'm pumped that Mercury is both a sponsor of this podcast and a safe place to keep my cash. It sure beats keeping my cash under my mattress again. Plus, it looks slick. I always get angry when back office tools are ugly. Newsflash. Finance people may wear both a belt and suspenders to work, but we like stuff that looks good too. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. Mercury simplifies your financial operations with powerful banking, giving you greater control, precision, and speed so you can operate at your best. Make the switch today, like I did. Tell them your boy CJ from Run the Numbers sent you. Mercury is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by Choice Financial Group and Evolve Bank and Trust. Members FDIC. One more call out I wanted to make is... You said once you come in, you actually do an assessment of what would it look like to exit here. I think that's really smart and something that's probably not said widely. Because if you are working for a private equity firm, you understand the expectations that at some point they have to get their money back, hopefully for more than what they put in. What's that mindset look like? What are you looking for when you say, you know, if somebody came in today and wanted to buy this, what shape are we in? I I think you need... You need some people within an FP&A function that are, that's probably more of an investment in that function than most businesses of the sort of size that we're talking about you tends to have invested in. Because you need, you need some smart people who can, who can tell the story or who can at least derive the data that enables you to tell the story of, of what's going on. And, and too often you come into a situation where there's a finance team, but really they're a bunch of accountants and billing and collections people, right? And they're, they're very good at debits and credits and, and maybe they know the latest IFRS or IAS or, or whatever that they have to apply, but try and ask them a question about or what, e- even a simple question about what's this balance sheet reconciliation even mean, right? I've got a balance here. You've, you've given me essentially a listing of the transactions, but what does it mean? Tell me what this number is that I'm looking at. And, and just ask yourself, when you go into your, into your new team and just ask yourself, how many of the people who are on board today, if they were asked that question, could truly tell you, oh, well, that means this thing. And if, if the answer is, well, none of them, you've got to do something about that because you need people who can answer that question because it can't just be you all the time asking that question. Sometimes a great offense is a good defense. And what I mean by that is having people who have your back and understand the information better than you do. Like you, you probably come in as a CFO and you say, I'm smart enough to figure out the answer if somebody asked me this, but you're going to have a lot of other things to worry about. So having the people there who can tell you from an analytical perspective what things mean in the larger picture, like that's so key to have somebody within the first few months that you trust. I agree. And one of the things that, uh, you know, sadly, I think within the finance community, we we probably tend not to have too many people who can take that proper step back. We have a lot of people who can create analysis, but the question is, what what is that analysis telling you and what is it telling them and how well do they understand the rest of the business? And that's why, you know, I think uh, having uh, high performers within an FP&A function it is critical to be able to get you to that point where you can where you can exit and even then you'll find there'll just be a lot of numbers on a page and my job as the CFO and I think you had someone on the on the podcast uh, a few episodes ago who said that they were essentially a storyteller and, and I'm in that same camp right I think that most important job for most CFOs is storytelling. It, it is being able to make the numbers that you have in front of you mean something to the people you're talking to. And most of the time, those people are only going to be able to have the capacity to receive information about three, four, five bullet points, right? So you've got to distill down what you're looking at into something that you can communicate in an effective way and tell them why that means 
this thing or that thing or, or why they should buy the business at the end of the day. Well, speaking of communication and telling a story, you walk into your first board meeting, you know, you, you've just joined the company maybe a couple months ago. Are you telling a story or are you just giving it to them straight of, of what it looks like in, inside the company? In that first board meeting, yeah. I am 100% giving it to them straight. Okay. Because there's no, there's no benefit in telling them a story at that point. I need to get their buy-in to whatever it is I think I need to do to, to get the team in the right place uh, to work with our working capital and, and make the changes that are, that are necessary. After, after the first meeting, I can, I can start crafting the stories as we go. But the first time I, I need their help almost inevitably because there's normally a reason why the CFO has been brought into a business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either the last guy wasn't any good or maybe they've just received an investment and now they need to professionalize things. So, usually there's work to be done. In that first meeting, do you lay out like, uh, I'm making it up like a 30, 60, 90 days, or here's what I'm going to do in my first year. Do, do you give them bullet points of like, hey, measure me against this. These are my initiatives. Yeah, I, I do. I don't I don't go out to a year because I, I think that normally if a board meeting is happening once a month or once every two months, I, I don't have enough visibility in that first meeting to yeah. be able to go out a year, but I'll certainly give them 100 days of what I'm hoping to accomplish. Got it. Got it. It's it's important to have that roadmap there. It also keeps you honest of like, okay, this is what I got to get done next time before I come back and talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. Steven, what's the most important relationship to invest time in other than the CEO? I know to a CFO, your, your number one customer is the CEO. And, and often people actually over-index on that. And sometimes they don't spend as much time with their peers and building those relationships. Who else should you look to forge a really good bond with in, in your first couple of months as, as a new CFO? In my businesses, right, I've worked in technology businesses. So uh, there are two people that I always try to make as my next priorities, which are the CRO and mm. the CTO. And both of them are, I think, equally important. I need, the, I need to have a trust relationship with the CRO. I need him or her to be able to come to me and say, you know, uh, I feel confident about this. I'm worried about this. You know, this is where we are on the numbers and for them to be able to be straight with me because it's, there's, it's not helpful if the CRO is papering over cracks yeah. in their organization that we can, we can potentially look at how we communicate that message externally, but internally I need, I need trust with the CRO. And I've been very fortunate in the uh, in in my current role. Uh, I've I've got a great relationship with our CRO, and and um, and I've had various excellent relationships uh, in the past. And and obviously, you know, in particular in the SaaS business, a, a lot of the a lot of the long term planning is all about well, what's the sales capacity look like? How are we how are we setting quotas? How are we setting quota attainment? What's the number of salespeople and so on? And and you're not going to build that long term plan without you know heavy investment of time from from the CRO. But then equally important in any technology business is is the CTO, because for me, I have yet to really meet a CTO who can answer the question, hey. We gave you $10 million last year. What did you do with it? What did I get? What was my product? I went into the store with $10 million. Where are we? And it's, it's refreshing sometimes when you do come across a CTO that says, Oh, I can answer that question. And I can tell you how your, you know, $10 million this year is what that's going to get you. I can tell you what I'm going to try and do with that. And to be able to be held to account. And part of the problem with that is sometimes the whole product side of, of the technical organization isn't there. Uh, we've recently at Puzzle moved to a, a product operating model. And I, I think that's going to be very successful for us. But I think unless you've got that, that interesting tension between, between the product, uh, a chief product officer or product uh, managers, and the development organization where someone is acting as a customer and someone is acting as a supplier, it's very difficult to hold people to account because otherwise technology departments will just go off and code stuff and then you'll get to the end of the year and be like, oh, well, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but we still spent all this money. What's going on? So it's very important to, to work closely with, with a good CTO. 
uh, and to provide them with the support. Because sometimes some of those organizational bits about how do I assign resources to this? How do we think about the return on that investment is, is difficult for them to get their heads around, especially if they've, if they've been promoted up from within the, the technical side of the business. There's also this tension of like, uh, is the tail wagging the dog? Like, is product driving what the engineering team is working on, or is engineering really driving what the product team is working on? And then you have to trace your investment through. Exactly. And are you are you actually are you just a feature factory? Are you just churning out feature after feature, or are you actually uh, standing back and saying, well, this is what the customers are really looking for, and it's about the customer outcome rather than a set of features. Would you mind touching on the structure that Puzzle has moved to within you know the dev development organization? Because that's a hot topic right now for a lot of CFOs. Sure. So there's a, there's a book called Transform, I think, and it's uh, moving, uh, moving your business towards a product operating model. Uh, and it's really about, it's about that question. It's about A, having an effective product organization separate from your R&D team. And so, some companies just, you don't have the the luxury of that. You don't have the scale. We're fortunate that at about 250, 300 people now, we've got the scale where we can separate those two organizations. Up until about six months ago, we were maybe just you know, one uh, mass of people within product and, and, uh, and R&D. So now we've, we've separated those out. The product team then is focused on the customer outcomes. Uh, and you move from being a feature factory to a, a company which is focused on product outcomes. And at the same time, very importantly, you have to think about well, what are the products, what are the products returning to us? Are they products that we are incubating? Are we investing in them or, or are we just maintaining them? Or indeed, are some of those products, is it time for them to be sunsetted and we, we, we transition customers into the next product, which is, which is coming along because that's going to affect the number of, the number of developers that you're applying against these, these different products. And you can, you can only scale a business if you're, I'd like to say ruthless, but, but probably, you know, at least conscious of that whole sunsetting process. And you, you put some steps in place for that. And I've heard you use the terms internal research and in development versus customer funded development well, what's what's the difference between those two Th those are interesting terms well it, yeah i mean that's probably more indicative of the kind of business that i was at before yeah uh, so it wasn't a saas business it was actually it, it was a software business with licenses and maintenance and customer funded development uh, where it was a business that was selling training to the military in mm. different countries around the world and so uh, a lot of times the military would say, well, this is great. So, for example, the Swedish military said, well, it's all fantastic. But, you know, we have 47 different kinds of snow here in Sweden. So could you could you do some work on your snow and we'll pay you to do that? And and it was a it was a virtuous circle there in uh, in in Bohemia because you'd get you'd get various customers paying for enhancements to the software that weren't necessarily on our roadmap or maybe they were, but not prioritized them paying for them pr brought them up the priority rank, but then the rest of the customers ended up getting the benefit from, from that oh, investment. Awesome. And we had a, we had a very effective user group, uh, who would, they would almost take it in turns. Well, okay, uh, Swedes, you need some, you need some snow. Okay. You guys, you're interested in this particular type of, of vehicle. Uh, you can invest in that. And, and they would sort of pa parcel out the investment that, uh, that as a group they were looking for. And, and and place those those orders with us, which was fantastic. That's really fascinating. I thought, uh, and maybe this is just a different way to read it. It's like, are you developing something that you can't sell yet? So it's it's like internally research and development oh, right. funded I versus see. customer funded. Like they're actually paying for it, so they're giving us money for it, so we can <laughs> continue to iterate, and it's not like a zero payback. Yeah, no, no. It's um, it was a very specific, very specific thing. But but I think there's something important. Uh, in there, it, even in businesses which are SaaS businesses and so on, is and in particular in smaller businesses, uh, you can end up getting very tied to one particular customer. Uh, you can get very excited about the opportunity that one customer provides to you, and then all of a sudden they'll say, "Well, okay, well we'll sign up for some extra consulting," and you know, and you end up moving your roadmap 
to satisfy that customer. Yeah. And I think the one thing that I would say is that as a CFO, it's always incumbent on you to say to the development team, all right, this is great. I love the cash and, and so on. However, you know, what is this doing for the long term? Let's make sure that we're not deluding ourselves and spending a whole lot of, of effort on something which really will only be of use to one customer. That's such an astute call out because in the moment you're like, yeah, give me that cash. We'll build that all day. If you're going to pre-fund it, you're going to write us a check for it. But you may be pigeonholing yourself where you built something that long term. Uh, nobody else wants this. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then there's an interesting statistic about how much software or what what percentage of, of a software uh, suite of programs ends up actually getting used by customers. Mm. And, and they say that something like 80% of software that is built rarely gets used by any customers. Or, or maybe there's one or two customers out there who are using that, that 80%. The vast majority of your customers are using 20%. 30% of, of the software that you're providing them with. So let's make sure that when you're making investments in software, that, that everybody has a very clear view that this will be something that your customer base writ large will want to use. Well, let's talk about that, investing in technical resources and figuring out how much you want to put behind different initiatives. How do you figure out, like if, if you have 100% to spend or, or maybe it's a percentage of revenue, like how do you split up you know, this is for a new product. This is for maintaining an old one. This is for fixing stuff that doesn't work. How do you, how do you, how do you work on that mix? Well, we have some sort of rough rules of thumb. Uh, if we're, if we're really wanting to develop something, we would describe that as, as, uh, in the incubation phase early on, we would probably put more than 30% of the revenue in as, in terms of the costs that we would end up spending on that. And obviously if it's brand new, it would be, uh, you know, an infinite uh, percentage yeah. of the revenue, yeah. right? But but typically, if we're if we're making a heavy investment in something, it would be over thirty percent. Then if we're if it's if it's a core product that we're looking to enhance and invest in over time, somewhere between fifteen and twenty five percent of the overall revenue would be what we would expect to spend on continued development of that. And then finally, if if we're now talking about a product which you know, we're not intending to invest a great deal more in. Uh, we need to keep it running. We've got customers. It's generating revenue, and and we've got a good ARR on it. Well, you know, somewhere between seven and thirteen percent of its revenue is what we would expect to spend on it. And and one of the things that we have as a benefit at uh, at Puzzle is we have we have a subsidiary in Bulgaria which is where I've got a lot of my finance team. We have quite a lot of our support team and also some, some of our technical resources. And uh, what one finds is that certainly in some of the countries of the of Eastern Europe, uh, Bulgaria here at Puzzle, in, in Bohemia's case, it was the Czech Republic, you get some excellent, excellent technical resources who've got fantastic education. Uh, and you can end up moving the maintenance of some products uh, to those to those locations, it'll cost you a lot less on a per head basis, and uh, and you can then deploy those resources in developing new functionality, new uh, uh, and new parts of the product. Stephen, uh, incubate, invest, and maintain those three buckets. Which which of those do you think companies uh, get wrong most of the time, or or, or over index on? Well, as I as I was saying earlier, I think that. The ability to make a decision to sunset a product yeah. uh, is is really important. So I think people spend too much in the maintain phase. That's what I was uh, going to say for sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, and it's like let's be let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, we've just recently done an exercise of, and sometimes it's difficult, right? We've recently done an exercise of splitting out our ARR by by product, and then trying to split out our our cost of goods sold by the same product. And I'll explain why that's difficult in a moment. And then our R and D team by by product. And of course, the problem is that if if you're running on AWS or Azure or whatever, you've got all of these cost of sales uh, that it becomes quite difficult to understand. Okay, which part of my product is that actually is that spend related to? And we've spent a bit of time going in and trying to trying to understand that better. So that we can truly have what our, what our cost of sales is. And then with the, within the R and D team, that's a bit easier, obviously, because, because they tend to be logging time. 
uh, and so you can you can come up with some reasonable assumptions on, on where that spend is. And so it's very interesting when you do that exercise properly and when you figure out then, okay, so uh, this is generating profits at this level and, and this other this other product is is not. So we've got to do something about the number of people who are on it or we've got to do something about our cost of sales. Go back and beat AWS up, which is always always one of my fun yeah fun, fun Friday afternoon activities. Frankly, <laughs> it sounds like you're kind of building a contribution margin analysis by product line. Y- yes, you are. You are, and I think that's the only way to think sensibly about your about your products. Uh, and and as I say, it gets quite difficult when a lot of your costs are shared across. You know, maybe your cloud services platform, maybe if you're in a data center, it's kind of difficult to figure out what what of those costs you should be allocating to individual product lines. Sure. For for new stuff that you incubate and then launch, have you ever tried to do like an R&D payback period, something like that? Yeah, I, I, I have. And we certainly did at, uh, we did at Bohemia. That was an essential part of that. I think we're getting to that point. Now at Puzzle, yeah, I'm sure that we're going to be at that point uh, in the coming months. I always go back and forth with myself of if I'm being almost too, I don't know, too stringent with how fast I expect funds to be paid back with new product lines. Also, when's the start period of of when you like, you know, turn the clock on? Is it when you <laughs> hire that first person to work on? It? Is it when you're thinking about it and it's taking up people's bandwidth? But like, should a product be making some money within 18 months? Should the, the development be fully funded within 24 months? And I really don't think there are that great of benchmarks out there for people to rely upon. I think, I think that's right. And I think it's just because it's a sort of how long is a piece of string question. <laughs> um, right. It, it really depends on the nature of your business because there, there are people who have got, you know, smaller, smaller applications that maybe they can, they can get to value in six months or, or, or something like that. You know, there are, there are people with far more complex, uh, complex systems. Like we have this contact center, uh, software customer exp- that then got glommed on with a sort of customer experience stuff. And we've got some voice bots and some chat oh, bots man. and, 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 and so on. And, and it, it all gets quite, quite complex. And we've got uh, elements of workforce management and case management. So, so it's a, it's a holistic solution for, for a contact center manager to be thinking of. But what that means is that, you know, a, additional products can be pretty complex because they've got to potentially cut across the whole, the whole piece. How do you square up? technical debt. We we had spoken to the uh, old CFO of Fitbit and current CFO of ACV Auctions, and he described it uh, as the calories that clog your arteries in any software or tech org, which I think is like such a great way of putting it. What are the conversations you have with your CEO or CTO when you realize that you're going to need to fund some cleanup here? It is inevitable in all businesses, in all tech businesses, that there is going to be tech debt. And I've seen it dealt with in a number of different ways. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, they put some tiger team on solving a problem and, and getting out right, of it right. in three months. And, and then you can really articulate quite clearly, well, this is the specific investment that we're making. And in other places you say, look, there's just an assumption that within the R and D spend, you're going to be spending X percent of it on a permanent cleanup of tech debt. We're never going to, to get rid of it forever. But, you know, we're just going to have to assume that there's a general inefficiency in new products. And it's one of those things that it's very difficult to quantify because oftentimes, you know, technical organizations maybe don't love to admit how no, much no, we're tech perfect, debt they've, right? they've got in there. So, again, I think that's, that's where a trust relationship uh, being built amongst the exec team is, is important. Um, and it's also it's interesting when you have a when you have somebody new coming into the CTO role as we have uh, here here at Puzzle. There's you know in much the same way that I in my first board meeting will go and tell them everything that that's right and wrong with the finance team and and systems and so on warts and all. Uh, we're getting the same messaging from uh, from Cigna as well, and it's it's you know refreshing when when you have that. Totally, totally. To touch on something that came up before, I noticed that a through line in all the places that you've been is you've managed uh, teams that spanned 
different time zones in different countries. And do you have any tips for building centers of excellence abroad? Uh, like what, what functions have you seen go well? What, how, how do you think about going abroad and, and, and spending in different countries? I have the benefit that I, I lived abroad. Uh, as soon as I qualified with PwC here in, uh, here in London, I ended up traveling and I became an audit manager in Santiago, Chile for, hmm. for a couple of years. And I think that gave me a, a great insight just into what it's like to be uh, in a different environment, what it's like to interact with people that are very, very far from uh, from what you would have experienced up until that point. So I think it, cultural sensitivity and an understanding of, of the differences in the ways in which people see the world is, is the most important thing you can bring to such teams. And then... You know, you have to be careful not to use some sort of stereotype. Oh, you know, in fact, in, interestingly, my, in my first, my first large job at, uh, which was at Viatel, uh, after I'd come back from, from Chile, uh, I was the VP of European finance, uh, initially. And I had teams, I had teams in Germany and, and in Spain and in Italy and in the Netherlands, basically all over, all over Western Europe. Uh, at the time. And, you know, those, those stereotypes might have made you think, oh, well, the Spanish, they'll be late in providing me with the, with the monthly information each, uh, each month. But the Germans, obviously, they'll be on time. And, uh, so let me focus it. And it's completely the opposite, <laughs> completely the opposite, because, because you don't want to, you don't want to make those assumptions because it's the people, uh, at the end of the day. Yes, there are cultural, there are cultural questions to, to bear in mind, but it's also about, about the team that you build. Uh, I think it's important to play to people's strengths. I think that, you know, in, in Bulgaria, in yeah. the Czech Republic, we have, you know, there are people who are, they're well educated, uh, very good at process. Uh, and that's why so many uh, of the, of the outsourcing companies do put, to put a bunch of resources in Eastern Europe, in Poland, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, right? Because, because, it's it's a very it tends to be quite an organized set of people uh, working there, and so you can play to that strength, uh, but understand that the people that you're working with are, are all people. They're not uh, just out of some a single cookie, cookie cutter uh, yeah. for that. And and then so then take take some of that benefit because there's there's also differences in imagination in the way in which you think about solving a problem. Uh, so there was a time when I was. I was actually weirdly for about a year, I was the CEO of a, of a tech company and I was, it was a biometric handheld computer company and, uh, and all the developers were in South Africa. Okay. And, and I was, and I was living at the time in Palo Alto. And like, if you draw, if you draw a line through the center of the earth from Palo Alto, you basically come out at Johannesburg. I mean, it's like the farthest point possible. <laughs> literally the other side of the world. Um, but the interesting thing about South Africa was that because they had been subject to sanctions and so on for, for so many years, uh, because of the abhorrent apartheid regime that was, that was in place there, they would find a way. In fact, they even have a, they have a phrase, uh, Bor Machavech, uh, the boer makes a way, finds a way to solve a problem. And so you had these amazingly inventive people in, uh, in South Africa coming up with solutions that were completely, you know, might have been thought of as off the wall in Silicon Valley, but they would, they were creating things that maybe you wouldn't have thought possible, uh, if you were within a more constrained environment. So, so long, <laughs> long answer to your question, I think, you know, find out what the, what the strengths are. You know, I've got, I have a pretty, pretty clear view on, on that today for finance teams. Find out what the strengths are and, and, and play to those strengths, but don't assume that, that everybody's going to conform to, you know, how you might think of people from a particular, a, a particular country and be organized. Get in front of these people, right? I, even when I was living in Palo Alto and working with South Africans, you know, I would be up at, at four in the morning to just get on the phone with them, make sure that they understood that, first of all, that you were, you were there, you were there to support them, and that that communication was such an essential part of, of managing remote teams. I mean, I think we've all been managing remote teams, you know, now over the last four years. I mean, before then, it was, it was slightly less, slightly less common, but I think that that, that the importance of having 
weekly one-to-ones with all of your direct reports, the importance of making sure that, that wherever the people are in the world, they know that they can contact you uh, and that you'll make the effort to have that communication is really important. When you come into a company and they are talking about as a strategy, moving some functions to elsewhere in the world, what are the most common ones? I, I know that you mentioned earlier uh, the maintenance function for technical uh, you know, uh, upkeep. What else? Finance, accounting, what comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are the ones. And then support. Uh, support is the uh, other one, yeah. which, which can be done you know, very effectively in relatively low cost environments. I think, you know, we, we have at Puzzle, we have an interesting, an interesting situation that we were born in the Nordics. We were born in Norway uh, as a, as a company. And, and, you know, Norway is quite an expensive place to do business. Yeah. Sweden's an even more expensive place to do business. So you certainly don't want to invest more than you need to in countries that are very, very high cost uh, when you can find good resources elsewhere. When you manage cross-border teams, I assume you also have to manage some cross-border problems. Do, do any come to mind of note? There, there, have been, there have been quite a few. So, I mean, in, in South America, uh, so when I, my first job, uh, when, I, when I stopped being an audit manager and went into yeah. my, first, my first line role, uh, I was the financial controller for Latin America for a, an Australian software company. And uh, we had people in, uh, in, in Brazil, in Argentina, in, in Colombia. Uh, and one guy in Colombia, uh, we had given him an American Express card, which, which actually American Express shouldn't have even been issuing because it was illegal <laughs> at that time to do transactions in U.S. dollars in Colombia. By the uh, way. But anyway, yeah. somehow he had, he had a company, company American Express card, had managed to run up a gambling debt of $50,000 on his American Express card, had also somehow managed to get cash back from his hotel and what? various other places to the tune of another $20,000. And and obviously, sometimes when you're dealing in some of those countries, you you might be a little worried about, okay, we've got to take some punitive action. This guy needs to be fired. And and so, so that was that was an interesting one. But by far the, the most... Uh, notable was probably yeah. at Access Devices, where I had an investor. Uh, he was he was a bit of a fly by night kind of guy. He was he was raising the cash. He was partying with uh, with people all over the place. He 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 would have all of those contacts with the high net worth individuals that were the primary investors in in Access Devices. And he went off to Hong Kong to raise some additional funds for for the business and and uh we were always running pretty low on cash and so i was like okay alex what have you what have you managed to have you managed to raise some further funds from from the high net worths in in hong kong so no i'm going out going out for dinner with them tonight it's going to be great you know we're going to be out in a limo out in the hills fantastic i will i'll call you tomorrow uh he didn't call me the next day or 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 the next And, and it turned out that um he had actually been arrested uh, and was in was in the hotel that uh, he was allowed to be in the hotel. He was uh, his passport was taken away from him. Apparently, a sex worker had died that night uh, somewhere in the hills around Hong Kong. He was in the car. I don't know quite what happened, but basically, he was under house arrest in the hotel in Hong Kong for about five or six weeks, whilst we're sitting wow. there waiting waiting for an additional set of funding to come through. And um, we're like, well, how are you going to get out of this? Well, I don't know. They're going to, they're going to set a date for a, for a hearing and, and so on, but I can't leave. And he had various connections back to, uh, back to Israel. The next thing we knew, a Mossad had apparently helped extract him from Hong Kong uh, and by boat. And got him out of the country and back to uh, back to Israel, uh, from where he eventually came back to the UK. Uh, he was a very colourful character, uh, and I never want to have to deal with investors ever, like that ever again. But an interesting story, nevertheless. That is arguably the most fascinating story we've had on the podcast in almost 100 episodes. Wow. <laughs> with that, I'm going to take you into what we call our long-ass lightning round. Okay. You're a successful guy. You've done some really awesome things, but you got to give it to me. What's one thing you've screwed up on the job? It could be this one or a different one. Way back in VSL days, I would say 
take the French VAT department seriously. Oh, say more. <laughs> no, it was, oh, it, it, was, uh, it was a very bad situation with moving lots of telecoms equipment around. And, and, and what happened was that the French VAT authorities had come into our business and said, we don't think you've got all the supporting documentation here and we're going to, we're going to slap you with a large demand. My local finance manager kind of poo-pooed it and said, well, it's fine. We'll, uh, we'll just get in the documentation. Everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. And I didn't take it seriously enough. And sure enough, we then get a massive demand for 25 million euros for VAT that was inappropriately declared according to the French VAT authorities. You know, and in the end, I go there, I take someone from KPMG with me and we're, we are, we're sorting through boxes and, and getting them all of the information which they, which they require. But that was, uh, that was probably the eight weeks of my career that I, I really didn't enjoy more than almost any other. We say in the U.S., Uncle Sam always gets paid. Yeah. Next one, if you could tell your younger self something, knowing what you know today, what would you tell them? You can spend longer looking for the right role. Don't, don't just jump at the first thing because you're worried, you've moved on from the last role, and you feel like you have to take something. Don't. Mm. I think a lot of people in the moment don't think about how long a career is. We, we all think it's very short, but like you said, patience and choosing the next step. Because, I mean, you can also only vest in one place. There's like the enjoyment factor, but then also the financial factor of like doing your due diligence in the company and saying, is this kind of where, where I want to invest my time? Yeah, yeah. Next one here. Can you walk me through your finance software stack? What are you using today to get the job done? We're, we're in the process of going through a digital transformation project. Okay. Because I'm, I'm not happy with the vast majority of the tools that, that were put in in 2019 when our private equity investors, when they invested. So we have a, we have a billing system that I'm not happy with, which doesn't integrate with, with almost anything. We have a consolidation tool, which again, very few people seem, seem to use and seem to, seem to be able to manage well. So we're, we're actually, we're actually going through this transformation starting at the, at the RevOps end of things. Oh, okay. So we're looking to swap out CPQ and then that will kind of determine everything that runs downstream. Uh, so from you're starting, starting in the front of the house and then working yeah. backwards. Yeah, because, because frankly, if you're trying to figure out what's my ARR, what's my, what's my net dollar retention, all of those sorts of things, it all starts with having your CPQ done right. Up right. Okay. And invoicing is almost a, a byproduct of that. Well, I apologize because a lot of uh, hungry BDRs are going to be cold emailing you, trying to. No, no, no. They, no, no, no I, I know. I know. I know what I'm doing. I know. Don't. Don't come and. Don't come and. Don't come and attack me with that. Yeah. <laughs> Last one I got for you. What's the craziest thing you've ever had someone try to expense? A breast reduction surgery. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you approve it? <laughs> no. No. Uh, it, it was a rather a rather curious uh, situation in Brazil. We'd uh, we'd 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 moved some people from Australia to Brazil, and uh, and uh, and somebody they suggested that uh, it was a, it was a necessary part of them to be able to do their job, having moved them as expats from uh, from Australia to Brazil. And there was something specific about Brazil that that obviously meant that this was required. Uh, I, it didn't go very far. Wow. That's a first of the pod. Steven, uh, you're one of the most interesting CFOs I've spoken to so far, and I can't thank you enough for all the knowledge you've imparted on us and the great stories. Uh, my, really my pleasure. It's been, it's been great. And you know, keep up, keep up the work. I, I think you're right. There's not enough stuff out there for, uh, for CFOs. So I think your, your podcast is, is really good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Run the Numbers is a mostly LLC production. Yelling an intro by Fat Joe. Artwork by some AI thingamajig. Podcast and video editing is done by Cleancast at cleancast.io. Nothing said on this podcast is intended to be business or investment advice. It's the sole opinion of me, a guy who feeds his dog too much ice cream and has a history of net operating losses, lol. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. And also check out MostlyMetrics.com. That's my newsletter where I explore business models and financial metrics. Thanks for riding with me. Share this with your friends. Peace.